audiology, as well as computer information sciences. And my lab's called the Communication um, What I'll be talking about is a little bit different um, in the sense that um, a lot of my work has to deal do with people who have communication disorders, and so it's not some of the health problems that you've been talking, thinking about so far in terms of um, specific health issues like, um, you know, healthcare in terms of sitting, standing, uh, weight loss, and so on and so forth. So it's more about communication disorders. So um, there's about 311 million people in the U.S. Right? Um, this is just a few of them, and if you take 10% of those individuals, 10% of that, which is a sizable amount, 31 million people in the U.S. have some sort of communication disorder, albeit mild in some cases, but in about 3 million of those individuals, it's really severe in the sense that you need an assistive technology. So a lot of my work deals with these, um, some of the work actually deals with the larger population of individuals who have communication disorders, uh, but most of it is focused on the smaller population, which is th still 3 million people or so, who have such severe communication disabilities that they require assistive communication. <clears throat> okay, so traditional speech language treatments and assessments deal with people face to face talking to clients, either children or adults, teaching them how to produce speech more clearly. Because if speech has been affected either due to a birth defect or due to an acquired injury later on in life, they've had a stroke, they've had a car accident, they've um, acquired Parkinson's disease or MS, their speech deteriorates over time. Um, and oftentimes what we do is uh, speech clinicians will work with these individuals to retrain that, retrain the brain to be able to produce speech again or language again. I'm focusing more on speech, which is the muscular act of producing sound. Um, so often most of the the clinical practice is focused on sort of face-to-face -face interaction, one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in groups, helping people rehabilitate themselves so that they can produce speech again. So one of the issues with healthcare costs rising so much is how can we deliver this um, kind of treatment to more people, whether they're in, in cities or, or living urban in rural areas and so on, um, and how can we do this beyond just a one-on-one -on -one interaction? Um, so one way is if we can elicit um, interactions, spoken interactions, not just um, via another human in the loop, but maybe a computer program or some, something like an agent where you're talking, you're playing a game with someone, but um, and that's helping you elicit communication. So what we've been doing in our lab is building a series of games, some of them are two-player games, some one-player games, where we are trying to figure out ways in which we can get people to talk, because that's what you need to do if you're trying to do speech remediation. Um, so this is an example of a game where there's a person on one side of the one-way booth one, and a person on the other side of the one-way booth. They can't see each other, so they must communicate via speech, but they have a shared context that they're talking about. Uh, this is still not sort of deployable in terms of lots of people using it, but what we're working on now is a new um, type of game where it would be played over the web um, where and the person that you're trying to remediate would also be wearing um, a sensor on their tongue or on their lips, wherever, whatever you're, they're working on. And they would be able to see not only what their movement patterns are, but maybe a clinician's movement patterns that were training the right trajectory of movement that they're trying to practice. And then you're playing this again within the game context. So uh, there's a motivating reason for why you're playing. You're, try, you're eliciting communication in a contextually relevant way. And it's not like you're asking someone to just read a series of words and sentences, which is kind of uh, there's no reason to communicate if you're doing something like that. Mostly you want to communicate because there's a specific task. Um, so that's really, those kinds of uh, applications are for the sort of that larger population of people for which you're remediating speech. What about people who cannot speak um, very clearly using speech alone? So they have to use devices such as these um, assistive communication devices. Many assistive communication devices exist today in the market. In fact, there's uh, a huge, almost cottage industry of the number of uh, manufacturers of communication devices. And many of them now are portable and available on um, iPads and iPods and so on and so forth. What's common to a lot of the assistive communication devices is that um, they've been designed with these schemas of what clinicians think 
people would want to communicate about, which vocabulary should be on there, how the syntax should, how people should make sentences, and so on. What we're trying to do in our laboratory is center the design of these assistive communication devices based on the user's needs and the user's abilities. And so one device that we built, um, th the one on the left-hand side, is called IconChat, where we use things like the, um, you can't produce, you can't put all the icons on a screen at the same time because it's very difficult to show all the vocabulary that you may want to talk about during the day, course of the day. So what devices often do is layer this vocabulary in terms of um, categories or themes. What we've been doing in I Can Chat, and this is something, some work that uh, more recently we've been doing with Dennis's group who spoke earlier, um, is using context. So things like what time of day is it? Who are you talking to? Where are you in geographically? That may change the vocabulary that you want to use. Um, and so we only show, or we, we try to show up those vocabulary items, or um, filter them up in the screen. You can still have access to other things that, you, that may not be relevant to your location and your time of day and so on, so that you don't, ha you don't lose access to that, but you just have access to the more contextually relevant things faster. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, we're trying to get away from this array-based communication system. Like that's kind of like a grid. The reason we've been that communication devices were built that way is because it's just a very common way to think going from paper to uh, electronic means of how to arrange icons on a display. What we've been thinking about is when someone has a lot of spasticity or um, very poor motor control of their upper arm, which is why they're using an assistive communication device in the first place. If they could use their arm very well but they couldn't speak, they'd probably just write notes or type, right? So these are people who have physical disabilities as well as speech disabilities. So we're trying to look at, well, is that this kind of a screen really the kind of screen um, that they would be able to actually even access all the vocabulary on the screen? Or should that vocabulary be arranged in some other way? So when you think about someone with a lot of spasticity and upper, uh, upper arm rigidity, it may be that their movement pattern is more of an arc. And so what we've been doing is thinking about what kind of control do they have of their motor system? And then can we rearrange the interfaces to actually um, make use of their abilities and to reflect those um, and best be able to meet those abilities. Um, another related project along these lines is um, that the, these devices are often, the individual selects a series of icons, makes a sentence, okay? Um, and then a sentence is spoken out loud using synthetic speech. The synthetic speech on those devices is very generic. And so what we've been doing is building personalized um, voices for those devices by taking a little bit of voice from the disordered speaker, taking a lot of speech from a healthy talker um, who we want to sound more like, and melding those together and building personalized voices for people who use assistive communication devices. And that's kind of an, an application space of um, how we're moving toward more um, uh, special, specific or customized devices for individuals who have these kinds of needs. Okay, and that is where I'm going to end if you have any questions.